Hi, I'm Ryan Estrada, the co-author of Band Book Club, which is up for an Eisner right now, which is weird and cool. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a returning guest. He hasn't been on the show since 2014, but he is a very talented artist and writer and uh, in the comic industry for uh, over 30 years now. Congratulations, by the way. We are joined today by the ever-talented Ryan Estrada from, of course, the co-writer of Band Book Club. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty great. It's, it's pretty good. It's been far too long since we've had you on the show. A lot has changed in your life. First off, yeah. I want to congratulate uh, both yourself and your wife uh, for being nominated for an Eisner for this amazing uh, book, first off. Thank you very much. We're very excited. Speaking of which, Hensuk, you want to, before you go to bed, uh, my wife is actually here with us. She's the co-author. It's midnight here. She's about to fall asleep, but she's going to pop in and say hi. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so hi. much. You, you wrote hi, it. Ryan. Kim Hyun Suk, I am a uh, co author of Band of a Club. Uh, it's, uh, since it's, it's, it's midnight here, <laughs> so I go to bed. Before that, is the uh, uh, please vote, vote for me. <laughs> thank you. Th <laughs> thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> well, that, that was the fastest ever guest appearance I've ever had. So There you go. <laughs> well, we can end the show now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this book. I, I've read through it. it. It's an incredible book, first off, um, to showcase the struggles of, oh, perfect, to showcase the, the struggles of the clash between democracy and, of course, between uh, a, a dictatorship in terms of trying to find freedom and freedom of speech. It was just beautifully written. Um, I, I, I read through it twice. It was incredible. Truly, uh, so you, you both did an amazing job. But for those that don't know about this particular book, and they should be picking up a copy uh, published uh, at Iron Circus Comics, uh, tell us what it's all about. Basically, it's a true story of Hyun Suk, who you just met, who uh, in the 1980s uh, accidentally became the youngest member of an illegal banned book club which at that time in Korea was not just like at your local library where they have a banned book club that they, you know, invite kids to. Back then, if you were caught reading banned books, you would go to prison. You could be put in a labor camp. You uh, you could be disappeared. Uh, her friends were taken and uh, t tortured uh, all the time. She was interrogated by the KCIA uh, just because they wanted to read books. Uh, not even like super, like one of the books that... Uh, people could be arrested for reading was um uh brown bear brown bear what do you see the children's book and that's only because um the whoever was banning books confused bill martin jr the children's book author and bill martin jr the socialist philosopher it's that that's how random it was the books that could get you in trouble so uh, this is something I didn't know about for a very long time. We've been married for years and years when it casually came up in conversation. And in writing the book, I got to uncover this whole history of my wife's life. And we were able to tell this story about, you know, ordinary people's lives in extraordinary circumstances, but from the point of view of the people that lived it, where it's not like this, you know, uh, apocalyptic thing it's just people were trying to live their lives and we got to tell the story of just you know people having romances going to classes and also dealing with this you know totalitarian government it's it's just amazing how a government can take power and to force the masses to to be subservient it, it, it's amazing how a single step that could have even happened in the United States if that were would have occurred back yeah. when King James or King Edward was, you know, back mm -hmm. in the 17th century. For a country that 
still has an ongoing war technically between North and South Korea that was never resolved. Um, and to have a government force that upon the masses is just, it seems mind boggling to this day, yet it still occurred. Yeah, and what's fascinating about it is, is how far South Korea has come since then. That was one of the interesting story things about the story is that we kind of got to show the steps that not just one person, but everyone in the country took that kind of led to getting rid of that structure. And now Korea is one of the best democracies on the planet. And it, it, it came from people standing up and taking risks and uh, a lot of sacrifice and a lot of troublemaking. And uh, I guess it was fun to, to tell that story of those people. You mentioned, I've, I've seen other interviews in the past here, and I'm not trying to rehash the questions though, but in, in writing this book, you had to reach out to the survivors as well too. You had to reach out to those people that were fighting constantly for, for decades to get this democracy that they had. Yeah. What was the first thought that came to mind when it, learning their stories about these, this uh, issue that they were going through? Yeah, the biggest thing was the difference between how I felt about it and how they, they felt about it because I was just completely fascinating, fascinated excited about every detail and you know when you interview people I'm, now these are you know my wife's friends from college these are her teachers these are people she knew so it's not like we were just approaching complete strangers but still you gotta wonder like we're you know i'm asking them to give me the the details about times they broke the law like some of the most traumatic things they've done and like very personal details about their their lives and not a single one of them was like, no, I, I don't want to talk about it. They were all like, I'll tell you whatever you want, but who's going to want to read about it? Hmm. Because to them, it was like, it was Tuesday. You know, it was just their normal lives. It's kind of like, you know, the situation people went through living through a pandemic and a lot of the things that have happened in the world in the last year. If, if you told that story to anyone before 2020, it would have been this amazing story. But now everyone's been through it. So they're like, what? what makes me special like everyone has a story like that where in korea everyone of that generation has stories like this and so to them they don't imagine you know even hyunsuk didn't imagine she's like why would anyone want to read a book about my college life uh but for people who haven't been in that situation it's a wild uh experience that kind of is relatable and also unimaginable in in many different types of ways do you find that this story is is relevant today in terms of today's political culture around the world yeah we could not have imagined when we started working on it how relevant it was going to be but like ab after we written the script like politicians of the day would like repeat almost word for word something i'd written in the script <laughs> or like you know the just history just kept repeating itself and you know seeing images on the news that looked like images that were in the book and uh you know when we when we started the book, it was like, well, here's this obscure bit of history maybe people might be interested in. And then by the time the book came out, like AV Club was saying, it's impossible to imagine uh, a, a time when this book would be any more relevant. I'm like, oops, all right, I made a relevant book. <laughs> the One of the other things that's interesting is the fact that it speaks to the masses. It doesn't matter what, what age you're at. It doesn't matter you know, who is reading this and, um, you know, just, just in, in seeing the struggle, sorry, I'm, I'm getting teared <laughs> just thinking about this, the, the struggles they went through when it comes to what they had to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Like looking back on it now, has the healing started? Yeah, I think Korea has changed so much that that is kind of, for a lot of people in memory and i know but i know there are people who never did recover i have a, a friend who's working on a documentary about her uncle uh who he kind of never recovered because after you know he went to jail and then after uh he got out of jail he was followed for the rest of his life he wasn't able to work and uh like his own family turned on him because there was so much propaganda about what he'd done wrong and he just kind of wanted freedom hmm. But that was so horrible back then that it could ruin your life and he kind of never recovered. And years and years later, the government uh, uh, pardoned all of those people. And you know, there was a big 
thing where they pardon people that have been arrested and but he it came like a few months after he died he'd been wanting it for so long and finally ended up uh you know dying before it came so there are people that were never able to recover but now this is kind of a you know you know not that everything's perfect in korea there's still a lot of people fighting for various changes but so much progress has been made that a, a lot of healing has been done at least for the people that i've been talking to let's fast forward to a couple of weeks ago uh eisner's mm -hmm. put out their nomination list um mm -hmm. it's the oscars of comics plain and simple oh yeah you, you're it <laughs> you and your wife are are in that list congratulations thank you for what makes me so excited about that i'm excited because I grew up a comic nerd, like dreaming of this. Like I was pitching the newspapers when I was six. So like I knew what the Eisners were as a baby. And I was like, <laughs> one day I'm gonna, I'm gonna be on that list. And like, this is everything I've wanted. And like, it's a, you know, it, it career changing and everything. And on the other hand, you have my wife who like, I've had to explain eight times this week what an Eisner is. She has <laughs> no idea. She's like, oh, it, it, it's some, I, I, some Eisner thing, I don't know, and um, so it's it's fun to like that I not only got it, but I've somehow tricked my wife who had who had never even planned on making a comic and not just making a comic, but being an Eisner nominated and hopefully soon Eisner winning yes. comic author, and that cracks me up. <laughs> but it's a, it's a good list of I mean I love seeing the nominees for every list because it. Uh, I get to see what's happening or at least what's being noticed in the industry mm -hmm. and web comics in, in particular. That's how, you know, this show got started. That's that, that's how I met mm -hmm. you. So to see this list and to see yourself and your wife on this list is, is amazing. So for mm -hmm. a person that's been in the industry for 30 years though, you know, how, how freaked out are you? It's just like, my name is on this list. Like, I can't believe it. Yeah, um, lots of, of heroes of mine, lots of people that I've come to know. Uh, I'm excited to be on there with Ryan North and, and Stan Sakai and, uh, uh, you know, even all the people that have won it in the past. Um, you know, it's, there's so many great people on there. And so I'm, I'm excited to, you know, I've, I've, like I said, I've wanted to, to do that for a long time. And who knew all this time all I had to do was ride my wife's coattails. <laughs> All the things I've tried to make since I was six years old, all I had to do is ride my wife's coattails, a woman who thinks comics are for nerds. <laughs> well, even better is you should just listen to your wife's stories more often and just write a series about her life. Plain and oh, yeah. We're, hey, we got we got the pitch out to publishers right now. We're working on it. That's awesome. We're working on more Hyunsuk stories. With everything that you've done in your career, though, from from decade to get decade, you know, let's kind of take a step back in your in your own history here. Mm -hmm. um, when in the first ten years of your career, what was your your crowning achievement that you are you can always point back to saying, you know, this is how I started making it in comics. Well, like I said, the uh, the, the first ten years of my career were, um, I guess, starting when I was six and. Uh, a lot of a lot of submitting and pitching but i didn't get any bites like but i kept bugging them until my local newspaper hired me at 16 and i did a comic strip called uh pet peeves that was about an orange cat who's too lazy to chase mice because that was the only life experience i had was reading garfield um but i i did it for like a year and then uh i i went to animation school and at first I, I kind of got involved in web comics and uh, some of the very first things I did, I did a lot of comics about my adventures. I started traveling the world and I would make comics about the things I did. I, I got known for doing uh, uh, challenge comics, the you know 24 hour comic. Uh, I kind of took that to the extreme where I did various lengthenings of it until I did the 168 hour comic, which was one week straight locked in a camper drawing a book which is actually i have a copy let me see that one very old book that i drew in a week uh it, it kind of looks in parts like i drew it in a week <laughs> but you know it's uh 
it was fun. All each of the characters in it ended up being spun off into other books I've done since. But um, yeah, I, I mostly just did web comics, and for years and years I tried to get things published, uh, and publishers never really bit. Um, so I just put everything online. A lot of it are released under Creative Commons. I'm just like whatever, just a you know here's some comics. I'm and I finally like I'm never gonna you know get published or make any money at it. And then now here I am getting stuff published still not making any money because it's comics but what are you gonna do <laughs> so when this book came out when when band book was first put together spike of course from iron comics she's been mm -hmm. in in the industry for a long time as well too um she approached you or both of mm -hmm. you i should say how did spike approach you uh and okay. and how was the feeling that this was actually an important book to publish yeah, it was actually uh, the only book I've ever gotten by subtweet. Because <laughs> uh, I, it, like I said, I heard this story about my wife. I'm like, what? Uh, you were interrogated by the KCA? When did this happen? And that, like, that's all she told me. It was just like, yeah, it's just a thing. I got interrogated, whatever. So I tweeted about it. And then, like, two weeks later, I'm just scrolling through Twitter and Spike was talking about like, she was on a thread about like her dream projects that she'd like to publish. And one of them said, uh, my time in a band book club in Korea, in parentheses, if you think this is about you, it is, please DM me. <laughs> and I'm like, Spike, are you subtweeting my wife? <laughs> uh, and she's like, send me a pitch. And so we sent her a pitch and uh, she was into it. And I'm like, Hyunsuk, do you think like there's enough here to because like i said all i knew is she was in a band book club and i'm like do you think there's enough here to like turn into a, a book and she's like i don't know but we can try mm -hmm. and then everything she told me every single day we talked about it i'm like wait and you did what and then what happened and then like even like a year into writing like we just we'd interview someone else and hear more details and then like i'd, I'd write a script and she'd be like oh yeah i forgot to tell you this happened. I'm like, wait, what? That's the ending of the book. That's the climax. <laughs> so it was, it was a fascinating thing of like learning more and more every single throughout the entire um, process. And there's things I've, I've learned even since then that like, like I said, we're pitching more books because oh, awesome. I, I, there's more stuff to, to tell. Um, yeah, it just kind of kept growing. And I, I, at first we pitched it as like, a, I'm like, we can, cause Again, Hyunsuk was like, ah, I don't know, not much to it. So I'm like, well, maybe we can get like a hundred page book out of it. And then like we did some interviews and I found out about like the, the guy that ran the two newspapers, the one that the cops approve and the one that he does illegally and hides behind toilets. And I'm like, well, we just added 50 pages to the book. <laughs> and then we learned about some other stuff. And like we had, an, I'm like, okay, Spike, it's 200 pages now. And it just kept growing. <laughs> I'll start off with this though. Is there anything that, that you want to share about um, anything you want to share or anything you'd like to add that I haven't asked about that either about this book or about yourself I mean I, I know it's like 1230 there I'm trying to like be huh? conscious of your time so hey I I'm gonna be up all night inking comics so oh, it's all, right. all good <laughs> sure. uh, yeah um, the well the other book that came out last year is student ambassador the missing dragon uh, that's a, a middle grade book that I did that is something that I've I've been working on since I was a teenager and I was a student ambassador. That's my fun little adventure story about a, a little Mexican American boy who has to become friends with a little kid dictator and they go on an adventure and solve mysteries and I have to learn how to read Korean and uh, it's just funny goofy adventure stories and I don't know I'm just working on so many other things now and hopefully trying to get a lot more books uh coming out i'm working on a book called occulted now with uh mm. my friend amy rose uh that's kind of a follow-up to band book club in that it's about how she grew up in a cult uh in that was just down the road from heaven's gate back when uh the mass suicides happened and, wake up, yeah. and how she uh kind of got out of it by finding uh an off-limits uh library and reading banned books that taught her everything she needed to get out and i'm i'm pitching or we're also working on student ambassador 2 and a whole bunch of other books that i'm pitching so i i i don't know i love making stuff and i'm making lots of it do you ever get tired of it though when it comes to creating comics do you do you just have one no. of those days where it's like you know what i just don't want to do anything 
Well, I uh, I absolutely have days where I don't want to do anything. And my, my secret is I don't do anything. <laughs> Every artist is always like, the, the secret to making art is you got to sit down, you got to do it every day. You got to write even if you don't feel like it. And I'm like, that's that's the worst advice in the world because if I don't feel like working and I sit down, I'm going to make art that I hate. Hmm. And the next day I'm going to have to redo it and I'm going to hate redoing it. And then I'm going to hate working on this book and it's going to be a bad book that I don't enjoy working on. But if I don't feel like it and I'm like, you know what? I feel like going on YouTube and binge watching clips from a show that I hate. Then I will binge watch clips from a show I hate sometimes for weeks or months at a time. And then I'll be like, I'm so sick of binge watching the show I hate. You know what I really want to do is make this comic and I get really excited and I do it. So there are whole stretches of months where I do nothing. But when I feel excited about something, I get so much done so quickly that people assume I work nonstop. It, it almost appears like that, though. I mean, I, I've I've looked at your website. I've seen your your catalog, your your background. Uh, you you just do so much. I'm surprised you just haven't dropped dead, or you have a caffeine addiction. One of the two. <laughs> no, I don't even drink coffee. Oh, uh, but yeah, I, I I love doing all sorts of things. I like to experiment with new art forms. A lot of stuff people don't see. Just stuff I do locally. Uh, you know, doing I've, I've been doing making films lately, getting some stuff in oh, film yeah. festivals um i've been you know doing podcasts and i do radio and all kinds of stuff i just love making things and i you know when i i don't feel like making something i move on to another project that i'm excited about and just i have a whole hard drive full of half or third or quarter finished things that one day i'll jump back in and work on that again and then you know like like i said this is something i started working on as a teenager mm. and it just kept on slowly but surely piece by piece getting done um that's what a lot of my projects end up being so yeah I just keep on working on stuff that's awesome I, i'd love to see your film stuff you know being a, a fellow film guy myself there I, I i'm always interested in shorts and and features and all that other jazz mm -hmm. too so yeah there's a a festival here called the liquid arts uh um 72 hour film festival nice. so i've i've uh done that several times and this year i directed one that was partially animated mm. and partially live action uh it was done in 72 hours and i also directed the live action so the animation is mostly just like stuff jittering a little <laughs> bit but uh we, we i did a kaiju film where it was instead of a giant monster it was a giant kitten huh. and uh and that was a lot of fun to do. We got, uh, I, my, my favorite thing about it was that I surprised everyone by, uh, having Malcolm McDowell in my film. Oh yes, that's right. I just, um, I, I, I paid him a hundred dollars on cameo.com <laughs> and, uh, he didn't know he was acting in the movie. I just told them my, my large cat needed a pep talk. And so I have like two minutes of Malcolm McDowell just talking sweetly to a fictional cat. And I just, uh, I put it in the film as though he was the, the president oh. uh, giving a speech about how cute the cat is that's destroying the city. <laughs> Best hundred bucks ever. Yeah. Everyone has one or two people that inspire them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? When I was a kid, I was obsessed with Chuck Jones. Um, I was the nerd who carried around a copy of Chuck Amuck, Life and Times of an Animated Cartoonist with me everywhere I went. Uh, and just read and reread it constantly. Uh, I watched his cartoons frame by frame, and I was just ob obsessed with uh, with him. And um, and a lot of other newspaper cartoonists. Uh, if, obviously, as like a six year old, I was obsessed with Jim Davis. Mm -hmm. um, but it it eventually turned into the Chuck Jones show all the time, and uh, a lot of the other Looney Tunes directors. I almost. I almost got to meet Chuck Jones once. Well, I, I found out after my family went on vacation and we came back to, I opened the mailbox to check the mail and there was a postcard from the gallery down the road mm. that said, Chuck Jones is going to be in our gallery doing a signing four days ago because oh. it came while we were on vacation. And I was so upset. I was inconsolable for months, uh, but I never got to meet him, but uh, he was a huge, huge hero. What about from a personal perspective? 
I think one of the, one of my biggest supporters early on was I had a, a teacher named Mr. White. He taught math and gym, and uh, my first daily comic strip was the comic that I did in the margins of my math homework. I draw a panel every single day, and he'd grade the assignment and then uh, write a note about the comic. And uh, and yeah, he was so supportive of me all that time. And uh, I've actually gotten to meet him again since. He's he's actually teaching in Korea now, just like me. Uh, so we're we're peers now, teaching in Korea. Um, but yeah, he's he's uh, a big uh, influence for me to keep going. Not that you know, like I said, when I was six years old, I decided I was going to be a cartoonist. So uh, no matter whether people wanted me to or not, but he was always very supportive. And your Wikipedia page, which I haven't looked at yet. But from besides all of that. I don't have a Wikipedia page. What? Okay, come no, on. No, I don't. I, someone made a Wikipedia page for me like 20 years ago, and then an editor deleted it and said I'm just under the bar of notability. So that was like 20 years ago. I have to pass that bar by now. Well, look, okay. Somebody make me a Wikipedia page. Your Twitter. I'm not allowed to. The fact that your Twitter verified as well, and I'm, I'm, verified. St I'm still not. I'm not a fair nightmare. <laughs> Come on, somebody make me a Wikipedia page. <laughs> From a professional standpoint, 30 years in the industry, comic industry itself, you've done a lot in your career, and you're now Ionizer-nominated writer as well, too, along with your wonderful wife. From that perspective, do you consider yourself personally successful? Uh, I think I have exactly the life that I want. Hmm. Um, I don't... Uh, I have never in my life earned a royalty on a book. Uh, I have holes in all my clothes. <laughs> um, if I stood up right now, you'd probably see a hole in my pants. So I'm not exactly like a rich man swimming in money. Uh, you know, I, I had never won anything until, uh, until this year. But I travel the world. I make the stories that I want to make. Whether or not people read them, I get to make them. Uh, I get to live in a cool city. I have a cool wife. I'm as successful as I could possibly imagine being. Uh, anything that happens from here on out is just a uh, bonus because I like my life. A lot of people can't say that, that's for sure. So I'm, I'm glad you have a, a good positive outlook on that. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I love them. I love, I love failing. Failing is like literally one of the coolest things you can do. Uh, the reason I, you know, I, I have a, my autobiographical comic series that I, I'm kind of on hiatus now called Ryan Made Mistakes. And the reason it's called that is because that's like the major theme of my life is making mistakes and failing. And every good thing that has ever happened to me has happened because of a hundred mistakes that I've made that led up to it, or a mistake that I've made that like turned out good, or even a mistake I made that turned out terrible. But uh, if that hadn't happened, um, I, you know, I never would have had the life that I have. So that's why I love telling stories about you know the time I threw a million dollars in the garbage can, the time I uh, got stranded in Japan and slept on a bench in a typhoon. <laughs> Uh, the all the opportunities that I've thrown away, um, you know, like uh, you know some of the professional things that like uh, uh, someone else might think like, you know, that was when I, I ruined my career. Like it's it's li like uh, I often tell a story about when I was making a book called Aki Alliance, and there was a, a publisher that wanted to run it, and it was like they they it was online, and they're like. We, we pay very little money, but like later on we can, uh, like we have a partnership with a publisher, so we might get something going. And there's this comic we have that looks kind of, we feel is kind of similar to yours. So like it can be like a sister project to that. And then I looked at the website, the comic they're comparing me to, and it looked like a six year old drew it. And I'm like, I was kind of insulted. So I blew him off. And then I later, later realized that that comic was Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Oh, and it was supposed to look like a six year old drew it. And uh, I threw away that opportunity because uh, I was being cocky. And uh, that was a mistake. But, you know, that that thing led to everything else that's happened in my life. So I, I don't regret it. It's just a really funny story of a dumb, 
a dumb uh, quick decision that I made by judging someone else's art. Um, so yeah, I I love mistakes. I love failure. Got a quick question about art. Do you think art is subjective? Absolutely. Um, I think that uh, anything anyone can make, there's someone that will love it. Uh, it may be very hard to find the person that'll love it, but they're out there. And, uh, you know, I, some of the things that I make are things that possibly only I think are funny, but uh, there has to be someone out, else out there. And the, if you make something that is so niche and, uh, you know, everyone says, I don't understand this. I don't like the look of it. I don't get it. It's ugly. Uh, that just means that the person who does like that, when they see your art, if you're the only one making art like that, they're going to they're gonna love it. The younger generation are looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own right, either as an artist or a writer or whatever they'd like to do creatively, anything in media for that matter. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? By making the art that only they can make. That's the thing I always say is just that, similar to what I said last time, if if you try and say, well, this is what's popular, so this is what I'll make, you're gonna make a pale imitation of what's already popular and you know, fade away because you're not as good as the thing or because you're not as passionate enough about the thing to make it. But if you make something so weird that again, everybody's like, nobody's gonna wanna read that, then you're the only one making it. You're not competing with anyone because no one else could make that book. You know, I'm making a book about, you know, no one else is going to make a book inspired by my experiences as a, um, as an ambassador. No one else is going to make a book about my wife's college times. Um, you know, all of my stories are based on my extremely specific wild experiences from you know traveling the world for decades getting into trouble so uh make stuff that no one can make but you even if people say no one will read it because someone will i hate to say this ryan but that ends this particular episode of two weeks talking but before i let you go please tell those that are out there where we can find you on social media and the world wide web of the internet well, if you go to ryanestrada.com, there's tons of free comics you can read. There's links to books, and there's all the social media you could need. I got all the buttons there, uh, so you don't got to type in nothing. Just go to ryanestrada.com. Everything's there. And, of course, uh, if you are eligible, if you are a comics creator, a comics uh, teacher, a comics librarian, anything involving comics, uh, make sure you register for the to vote for the Eisners and, uh, and vote. Because I really want my wife to be an Eisner. I want to be an Eisner winner, but I really want my wife to be an Eisner winner because it'll be so funny. Well, you definitely have my vote, that's for sure. Uh, I'll, right. gee, I'll be checking my email continuously, so I appreciate All it. All right. That, like I said, Ryan, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure having you on. Please come back in less time than eight years. I really appreciate All right. it. You're the booking guy, not me. Hey. <laughs> you booked the episodes. Uh, that's why I have the link. New, new link, calendarly go. slash Kurt Sasso. Real All simple right. and easy. It's on my social media, blah, blah, blah. You can, of course, find this interview and thousands of others, literally a thousand interviews on 2geekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com since 2008. I mean, I have the archive of basically comics and people in the industry that are either still alive or have unfortunately passed on. So history in the making on tgtmedia.com you can of course find other video interviews from various comic conventions as well as these the interview on tgt media on our youtube channel youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgt media and of course as i say every week everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching Hey all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Uh, thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.